Chapter 25 After the boys passed the bleachers, Jonathan Flynn shot out of the stands like a catapult. He didn't follow the boys, but stood watching, guarding the little kingdom of Soccerville. Sam imagined Robin Hood, her dad dressed in green tights, cloak and hat, complete with a red feather, bow in hand, ready to take down anyone who threatened Soccerville. She laughed out loud at her ridiculous mental image. Sam looked around quickly, noticing if anyone heard her, but everyone seemed preoccupied with either the game or their own thoughts. Sam felt no anger, no anger at all anymore. She even had to stop and think why she'd even gotten mad at her dad in the first place. She felt bad about all the mental cursing she had done. Plus, her leg was killing her now. Fatigue hit her in a tsunami-sized wave. Gratitude filled her when she noticed JT run into her dad's arms and her dad motioned for her to come down, finally signaling time to go home. When Sam walked into the kitchen, the smell of comfort greeted her. Everybody wash up. Dinner's ready. Her mother brightly stating the obvious. Ah, oh, crockpot. What a wonderful invention. Roast, carrots, and potatoes. All in some amazingly wonderful gravy. 5,000 calories of heaven on a plate. A wave of love and thankfulness for her family flowed from the French bread as she sopped up the final drops of gravy from her plate. Is it good, Samantha? chirped a sarcastic little voice. One of the girls. You have gravy all over your face. The other annoying little girl. Boy, Sam couldn't stand these two, and she almost said so out loud, when out of nowhere, she remembered her own lame attempt at sarcastic humor with her dad earlier. Instead, Sam thought, oh gosh, they sound a lot like me. That little moment of revelation, although not pleasant, made her chalk this moment up to one thing that she'd have to think about later and add to her list. Instead, she said, Y'all played really well today. Y'all are both really good at soccer. I can't play soccer at all. I'm proud of my little sisters. She must be really pleased with her mother's cooking. She thought, why not try a little gratitude out on her sisters and see how that felt instead of telling them how stupid she really thought they were. She wasn't sure what actually felt better, complimenting her sisters or the looks of utter shock on everyone's faces. Uh, that was really very kind, Sam. Her mother, the first to recover. The dinner's great, Mom. I didn't realize how hungry I was. Gratitude felt good. She hadn't felt thankful in a really long time. Maybe that's why people called it comfort food. Sam? Oh no, was her dad going to ruin the first moment of peace that she'd felt in months? Do you know Nathan Zorn? Easy question. No, sir. You don't know anything about him? No, not really. He wasn't in elementary or middle school with us. He just kind of showed up in high school. I think he's the leader of all the weirdos. He gives me the creeps. I saw him at the mall one day, and you wouldn't believe everything that he's got pierced. And that's just what you can see. Samantha, those are not very nice things to say about anyone. Her mother, the ever-present kindergarten teacher, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. I'm afraid I'm going to have to agree with Sam on this one, Lisa. This kid is bad news. He's never in the office all of that much, but two-thirds of the problems that I have to deal with somehow relate back to Nathan Zorn. Tell me what you know about Dustin. I, I just can't keep this kid off my mind. So Sam revealed the information that she had learned from Steve earlier in the day. 
She also recalled some of the elementary memories when she actually talked to Dustin. She also thought about all the practice for their fourth grade elementary graduation and the crush she had had on Dustin for that brief elementary moment. She decided to keep all that information to herself though. Even though this day had totally been one of her top 10 worst ever, the family time, sitting around, talking at the table, and remembering elementary school, when things played out so easily and the possibilities for life that made a crush on someone like Dustin Drake realistic, it provided for Sam a dreamless night. She actually felt good when she got up the next day, like she could conquer whatever Mansfield High School had to offer. Hit me with the gossip train. I can take it, Sam thought as she walked into the cafeteria, scanning the early morning crowd, looking for Steve. And there she sat. Queen Aubrey, holding court over her popular cheerleading crowd, waving her hands and clutching her chest with perfectly manicured fake nails. Did only Sam notice that even though she experienced near death for days, the days that she had missed of school, that her nails, and no doubt her toes, became freshly painted, and her highlights looked new too. No roots on this girl. No, nobody noticed, because everyone sat too engrossed in Aubrey's tale of her horrifying ordeal. As Sam watched, Aubrey's hands gestured they got wilder, her eyes got widened, the whole, tale vi the whole table vibrated as if an orchestra playing on her command. Then an arm slid across Aubrey's back and rested around her waist, pulling her closer. Aubrey's hair tossed elegantly to the side and her head gently descended on the shoulder that belonged to the arm gently now caressing Aubrey's back. Simultaneously, the table turned, all eyes now falling upon Sam, including chocolate eyes, the rich, dark chocolate eyes of Brandon Holiday, the shoulder on whom Aubrey's head now rested. No one but Sam saw the look of triumph in Aubrey's eyes and the tiny smirk on her lips as she gazed at Sam. Aubrey's face concealed to all by Brandon's strong, protective 